Ray Castillo, thank you very much indeed for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from California. Your passion is paleontology, but you mainly focus on Cenozoic predators, and you're currently serving an internship at the La Brea Tar Pits Museum in Los Angeles. So how are you doing today, Ray? And it's been a fine day today. It's a great California day. I'd recommend anybody checking out their local museum if the day is just as good as mine is. Well, before we start, let's just get a little bit more about you, your background, and how you became interested in paleontology. Yeah, well, like most kids, uh, I was interested in dinosaurs and, you know, just the fascination that uh, this whole world existed before ours. Uh, when I was younger, my father would take us to natural history museums and the La Brea Tarpets, which I now volunteer at. And as a kid, of course, I was much more interested in dinosaurs. I, I Who isn't? It's not yeah. until I grew older that I kind of started uh, learning more about, you know, the, the Paleozoic and the Cenozoic. And once I was out of high school, it was when I started taking my interest in paleontology a little bit more seriously. And the Labret Tar Pits really was a great place for me to uh, get my wheels going with that. And, you know, being into Cenozoic predators is, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun thing to be because... Not too many people talk about these animals. Ray, how would you best describe to someone what is meant by Cenozoic predators? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I have to explain to kids sometimes at the museum is that uh, the Labrea Tarpets doesn't have any dinosaurs. It's okay. consistent all of Pleistocene animals. And in reference, when I say Cenozoic predators, I mean uh, mammalian predators that started appearing after the extinction of the dinosaurs uh, 66 million years ago. So there's that 20 million year gap where there was really nothing going on. And then, you know, come the paleogene, there were a wide range of predators that we would recognize, but would still be very bizarre to us. Well, the La Brea Tar Pits is a relatively small museum in the heart of Los Angeles. And the museum has the best preserved uh, Pleistocene fossils can be found anywhere. These bones are perfectly intact and they're iconic for their m golden brown coloring that they have from the saturation of tar. And the La Brea tar pits themselves are still very much active today and scientists and volunteers still dig uh, for these bones on a daily basis. The history of the La Brea tar pits is such an interesting one to tell because it's so wide and so much happens in it. Uh, you see, miners came out to the La Brea properties looking for oil. And they started digging up the natural asphalt there and selling it to other places. And it wasn't until they discovered one tooth from a Smilodon where they kind of realized, oh my, we have something here that is unprecedented. And, and that's uh, saber tooth Hank, tiger you're talking about, isn't it? The Smilodon. Yes, yes, Smilodon, saber tooth tiger. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, everyone knows that. <laughs> um, right. Well, the, the owner at the time, uh, Hancock, he called in a friend of his who was a paleontologist, and the paleontologist immediately told him, "You have a gold mine here." And it, it, this is back in the old west, so miners started coming back and digging these bones out, and in large, you know, quantities. Um, and these excavations continued up until the 70s once the museum was already fully finalized and realized. And it got that signature look that it has today. The museum still existed prior to this, but it wasn't exactly the museum we would come to recognize. A lot of the fossils found at La Brea were put in the Natural History Museum in downtown Los Angeles. Um, and it wasn't until recently when more and more uh, research was being put into microfossils. And if you don't know what microfossils are, is pretty much, let's say we found this skull in the tar pits and it'll be covered in tar and in dirt. Well, a lot can be told from the dirt and tar collected off the skull. Uh, things like bug particles, uh, plant seeds, um, rat teeth, uh, bird feathers, uh, just small things like 
that, that can help us learn a lot about the Los Angeles Basin from 50,000 years ago. And one of the most common fossils found at Rancho La Brea is uh, the saber-toothed cat. And we can tell that the saber-toothed cat was brought into the tar pit by attraction to something that was already stuck in there, like a herbivore. Uh, so as a reference, just imagine a mammoth stuck in tar. This saber tooth mm. is going to want to pounce on and take a nice bite before he realizes that he's knee deep in tar. Like we see in a lot of that artwork. And <laughs> y- y- yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, whereas the mammoth would have been more drawn to water uh, or maybe a, a cool hiding spot. Uh-huh. Um, the mammoth only would require about two inches thick worth of tar for it to get stuck completely. Yeah. I mean, like I said to the other day, um, that's why I don't like putting pictures of that uh, paleo art of that on my uh, Instagram oh, because it's, the- I feel so, <laughs> so, so sorry for the animals that this, this must, we know that it happened, you know, so. Yes. The, the deaths were very much slow. And not only that, but they were in large quantities because the tar pits didn't go away. They would stay there over years and years and years and mm. just new animals would be um, brought into it. Well, I'm sure, Ray, that you interact almost daily with groups of school kids and ad- adults as well, of course, and mm-hmm. that they have lots of questions for you. Do you find that the interest in paleontology and evolution is growing? And what do people ask about the most? Well, if the interest in paleontology is growing, I can't really say for sure. I think there's always been an interest Mm. in paleontology, and I think Mm. there always will be an interest in paleontology. I think it's just knowing that there was a vast world before the ones we live in today. And in understanding that world, we can better understand ours. There's always going to be people who are interested in this field. And the kind of questions I get on a daily basis vary, vary, vary from person to person. Um, It could be something as simple as how do you put the bones back together to, you know, the morphology and taxonomy of a lot of these animals and how that has changed over the thousands of years. And and, and it's another beautiful thing at the tar pits that we're able to see uh, a lot of animals change in that 55,000 to 11,000 year range. Um, The people that ask the most questions, though, are kids between 10 and 15 These kids are the ones that I've seen that really have some burning questions and passion that they need answers to, and they need them now. Whereas adults kind of have this just overall general curiosity for it. Wow, you must get uh, a lot of kids who come up to you and uh, ask some really detailed questions. You must think to yourself, gosh, I think I've got a budding paleontologist here. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I've had conversations with people half my age who are rivaling the information that I'm giving. And wow. they've sometimes been able to tell me things that I wasn't aware about or change the way I thought about certain topics. Uh, just the other day, there was a little girl talking to me about the saber tooth cat. And I'm sitting there just stunned. I'm like, my goodness, this girl knows just about much as I do. And it's always important that we should encourage these uh, people that have these interests, mm-hmm. these kids. Uh, And that's why one thing that I make clear to the kids that show strong interest in paleontology is that take the opportunities given to you by your state, volunteer at a local museum, intern at a college, um, you know, get into geology or zoology, botany, anything that would get you familiarized with the terms that you'll be encountering with um, paleontology. Now, we're always hearing about mammoth bodies being found in the ice and Uh, in the permafrost. And I'm just wondering uh, what you think of this idea of cloning a mammoth in an attempt to bring them back to life. What do you think of all that? Well, first and foremost, it's a really cool idea. And if the first thought was honest, it's straight out of a Michael Crichton book like Jurassic Park. But I personally don't know a lot of the sciences behind genetics and cloning and replicating Um, But if I had anything to say about, you know, cloning mammoths is we shouldn't be focusing on bringing back animals that have fallen into extinction and instead try to clone the animals that are currently facing endangerment or extinction right now as we speak. Animals like rhinos, lions, tigers and polar bears Mm. need our help. And 
if we have the technology to clone a mammoth, why not clone our own animals and save the world of today for tomorrow? That's that's really great to hear that. That's a, I, I like that take on it. Um, although people are just they kind of want to see a mammoth because they've never seen one outside of a of you know a movie. But so I totally understand that that part of it. Right, America is known for its evangelical community. So, do you ever get young Earth creationists challenging you on the age of the Earth, evolution, etc.? And what do you say to them? Well, it's important to us that we never really make a guest feel unwelcome or uh, really truly opposed. And when it comes to young Earth creationists, they come in in small quantities. They're never in large groups unless they're outside. But the, the people that do have the courage to come up and talk to some of us, they'll bring up number one is the whole Adam and Eve. Not Adam and Eve, I'm sorry. Uh, Noah's Ark. They'll bring up Noah's mm. Ark. And they'll say, you know, things like, oh, like, I'm sure Noah's Ark had mammoths and things like that. And I'm not really the kind of person who get into it with an argument about religion. So I try explaining to them why mammoths wouldn't be in the area of the Middle East, especially at that time, um, or at least Colombian mammoths, that is. Um, yeah. another, another argument that they bring up is how come we don't see these transitional uh, animals? Like, mm. uh, yes, we have diversity among animals, but we never find the transitional fossils. And to that, I say that it's wrong, unfortunately. We do have a lot of transitional fossils from all kinds of animals. Oh, yeah. um, it's just the, I don't want to say the problem, but the dilemma with young Earth creationists is that even when they're faced with the absolute truth, they choose to deny it. And I can show them a million and one fossils that favor evolution over religion. They're still not going to you know, really take that as an answer. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's this Ark Park um, in Kentucky. Uh, they've even got uh, <laughs> transitional forms on there. Like, I think they have a very early whale, the walking whale, and an yeah. on there. That, how how it, dare you do that? It, it you know? makes me question a lot. Um, in the Bible, it says that uh, whales existed the way they are already. So to have an animal like Pachycetus in your museum of creationism doesn't really make too much sense. Yeah, I think they're, t they're just trying to take ownership of it like they did with dinosaurs. As originally, they, they denied even they existed, and now they have, you know, Adam and Eve riding on the backs of dinosaurs. So, yeah, and that's another The science thing that does I... kind of win, in, win out in the end. <laughs> right, and, and I wouldn't have a problem with it too much if really kids weren't as influenced by it. Uh, mm, kids exactly. are really strongly believing what they were told by their parents, which. Again, there's no judgment there, but to be met with facts and to still oppose is kind of a challenging thing, and especially when it's a kid compared to an adult, because you can't really debate and argue with the kid, in a sense. You kind of just have to give him the straight facts and hope that he takes that and does with it what he will. Yeah, but it's, it's a really great thing that you're doing because you are championing science with these, these young minds and you're not saying to them, oh, no, no, your religious beliefs are wrong and there's no God, you know. Um, I always say to people who talk to me about this, well, you know, God could have kicked off the whole universe, you know, but please don't denigrate the science because, you know, the proof is, is there. I think it's important to say that religion is fine and I don't think anybody has the right to say if religion is you know, something that's real or something that's false. All that people like me do are say what we know and that's it. Just inform the people and try to get the people to be interested in these fields or to take action, not only in terms of sciences, but of conservation and preservation for our planet. Absolutely. It's, it's really brilliant what you're doing. And, um, Keep going. I think it's really great. And um, we were talking the other day, you mentioned a YouTube channel you might be putting together. Can you talk a tiny bit of that, about that, or is it still sort of in the works? Uh, it's unfortunately still in the works, but uh, we've had this great idea to go to different landmarks that are paleontological related, uh, such mm. as the Libra Tar Pits, and just kind of give a brief history and exploration of that area to try and encourage uh, younger audiences to feel to go out and explore themselves because one thing that you know i always thought growing up 
and especially being interested in paleontology, was that, oh, all these paleontological dig sites, all these fossils, all these remarkable things are found elsewhere, outside, you know, your state or city. But in the time that I've been at uh, Rancho La Brea, I've seen that just there's fossils all over the place. And if you know where to look, you will find something as small as a shark tooth. Or if you're lucky, there was that student yeah. in South Dakota who found that triceratops skull. So it really is a, it really is just a matter of going out and experiencing it for yourself. Because even if you don't find fossils, you find something interesting in your city, your state, your county, your country. Yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned also that you're you're uh, aware of dig dig sites. You've been to a few dig sites around uh, America. Is that right? Uh, yes, I, besides the Rancho La Brea dig site, I've also gone out to Shark Tooth Hill in Bakersfield, California, um, where a lot of shark teeth are found, given the name, but also a lot of marine life, uh, such mm. as ammonite and sand dollars. Um, I also have gone to the Jerupa uh, Mountains, and they have a great uh, science center out there, a nature center, or it's something oh. like that. Unfortunately, I don't have the name with me right now. But they have this great Allosaurus fossil just kind of on display, wow. and I thought it was absolutely incredible. Excellent. Well, God, this is great stuff. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about your work. And if anyone wants to get in contact with you or follow your work, I'll leave your email and Instagram in the description below, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Excellent. Um, but before we sign off, I know you've already uh, incur said some encouraging things to youngsters, but let's just to say... If there's any watching right now, or anyone, anyone at all, is passionate about paleontology, uh, what advice would you give them right now? Well, if you're interested in paleontology as a whole, not really into specifics, I would suggest just read and read and watch documentaries. Try to get as informed as if you're younger. Try to get as informed as you can. Um, so when you get to the parts where you start learning educational topics and textbooks you are very familiar with it and something as simple as you know a, a, a small book like prehistoric animals goes a long way um, oh yeah and again check your local museums your local colleges for internships or volunteer opportunities or even just go out for a hike and familiarize yourself with rocks or plants uh, all this it, it does help and it does add up because Paleontology isn't just about bones and what we do with them. It's about the location where the bones were found. How did the bones get there? Why do the bones look the way they look compared to other bones? It's a wide range of things that are asked. And as an aspiring paleontologist, you should be ready to answer those questions, whether it's the right answer or not. The beauty about paleontology is that we really don't know for sure on a lot of different things. So anyone's guess is just as good. Okay, that was really great. Thank you, Ray Castillo. And maybe we'll catch up with you again in the near future. No, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed being here. And I hope that the young paleontologists watching take that first step into the lost world and find whatever it is that draws you to paleontology. Thanks for Excellent. having me again. No problem. See you again soon. Bye-bye now.